This last paragraph <clears throat> uh, will finish out this little section and then we'll start in on another one. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to start, I'm just going to read it because it goes along with what we were sharing in the last class. If what has been said in our last class concerning the reality of the Lordship of Jesus is true, then why are so many still not liberated? Quite possibly it could be because they have been functioning by the wrong kind of faith that has been based upon a wrong view of the cross. In other words, the cr Jesus at the cross made us free. No, he didn't, not in that sense. I mean, he, in fact, the wording that most people use is Jesus set us free. And Jesus said the truth will make you free, not set you free. And so, um, so the, the common sort of view of being set free is that I was a slave seven years or whatever it is, 12 years. I was a slave, and um, now I'm free. But there's, there's one denominator missing in that equation, and that is the cross. You are free, but you are, you know, uh, last class we, we read uh, Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not an entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then verse 13 says this, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And then, of course, uh, the next chapter over, verse, For God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified, and to me and I into the world. The cross he's talking about in, verse, uh, in, in chapter 6, verse 14, Galatians. Just look at that. What is he's, he's, he's glorying in the cross of his own crucifixion. I mean, it doesn't take, it really doesn't take much examination of that verse at all to come to the conclusion that he's not glorying in a cross that saved him from hell. He's not glorying in a cross that saved him from punishment. He's glorying in a cross that crucified him. Well, I don't know about you. That was an eye opener for me. I mean, because, you know, I've heard, I, you know where I get a lot of this stuff? I'll sit in meetings sometimes when I'm doing conferences. I'll be sharing, you know, different speakers and things. And, and, um, <clears throat> and somebody will say, you know, I glory in the cross. And, you, and then I watch the crowd respond, and then I see what direction that takes. And they're glorying in the cross that saved them, that liberated them, that blessed them, that helped them. And, and as far as I know, the only time the, it talks about glorying in the cross is the cross that put you to death or put me to death. Um, I don't know if I'll be addressing this in Houston or not. I've been chewing on it for over a year. And this is this little area I call crucified language. Crucified language. It's the use of the word crucified a, uh, a lot in relationship to us. And that Paul had this area of crucified language that he used. It was a regular part of his, of his lingo, how he presented things. And, it, and the, the thought of that caused me to get in and start really searching it out. And oh my, oh my, the application is almost always to us. And how many Christians think about crucified in relationship to us? Always to Jesus. So even though I know that true theologically, and I know that uh, through many years of searching that we're crucified with Christ, for some reason it was a refreshing wind as I began to look at it in light of crucified language, and that was a regular part of Paul's communications. It just, it just kind of woke me up on a few fronts. 
<clears throat> All right. So why are so many still not liberated? Quite possibly it could be because they have been functioning by the wrong kind of faith that has been based upon a wrong view of the cross. It must be realized that liberation is not based on the act of Jesus' death on the cross alone, but on our faith in the personal impact on us as to our death there. Now this is important. This is important because we say, well, I must focus on Jesus' death. And that's true. But that is not primarily a focus upon the day he was crucified <laughs> or the historical event. There's no power in the historical event. There's only power in the Holy Spirit breathed reality of our crucifixion with Christ. And I want the power of it. I don't want to hear somebody teach it and then you know, um, you know, for example, this, this uh, flu season going around. Well, you know what they give you to, to, uh, the, in that flu shot, don't you? They give you a little bit of flu. Did you know that? They put a little flu in there, and then your body, and the antibodies build up in your body, and it protects you. It keeps you from getting it. Well, the problem with hearing the cross over and over is that you can get a little prick and get a little bit in you just enough to make you, <laughs> you know, you're immune to it now. You have to, there has to be a passion in your heart to, to go, look, I, you know, that's great. That sounds great. Praise God, Randy. I'm glad you're alive and all that kind of stuff. But I want to know Jesus. You know? <laughs> And I'm, you know, and you know what? I did that when I was in Bible school. I mean, we had some great teachers, and I loved those men. I, they, were, they were great men, and I, I love them. But the Lord taught me very early. I remember reading David, and it said of David, I know, I know more than all my teachers, and he was young. And he wasn't just spouting off. What he meant was that his heart had pressed even further into the Lord. And shouldn't each generation do that further than what was in front of them? Instead of going, oh, you know, and me looking at, you know, the man, you know, oh, what a man of God. I'll never, that, there he is. You just ruined yourself. Just say, I, Lord, I want you. I desire you. Not more than what he's got. I just desire you more. And just keep that. Keep that going. Keep that fire stoked on the inside of you and burning. When it starts going down, stir it up and get it going again. And say, Lord, I, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm getting a little dry here or something like that. And, and raise the passion. Because you know what? The passion is in you. Most of you, you wouldn't even be here if that passion would, wasn't. It's in you. But when you let it go down, let's face it, it's like a fireplace where the embers, you know, when the embers go down, a lot of times all you see is this chalky looking dusty thing there. You don't realize that there's some fire. All you stir it up. <laughs> I've seen it happen many a time. You stir it up and just goes. <laughs> well, that's, you have that in you. But these classes are not meant to, as measuring rods of you or me or whatever, they're meant to stir the the embers up and get the thing going again and all of us have down times and this and that and whatever I remember somebody said never mind I'm not going to say it <clears throat> all of us have down times and times but that's the, that's the purpose of an environment and to, and to keep you know uh, I've heard people say well I'm going to be in church every time the doors are open Okay, now why? Well, because I'm going to be in church every time the doors are open. You know, are you hungry for Jesus? No, but I'm committed to open doors. You know, something, you know. <coughs> I'm committed to three services a week. Well, you don't even have that now. You have one. Most churches have a Sunday morning service. That's it. You know. It, yeah, it has moved. It is. I mean, it, 
It went from the book of Acts where they met from house to house daily to my generation where it was three times a, a week to now it's one time. And pretty soon it'll be once a month or an online chat room. I don't know. Yeah. Chatty chat, we're going to talk about Jesus. Uh, sorry for ranting and raving. <clears throat> All right, I'll read that again. It must be realized that liberation is not based on the act of Jesus' death on the cross alone, but our faith in the personal impact on us as to our death there. His death that happened 2,000 years ago did not kill sin, law, the world, etc., as far as we were concerned. If it had done so, then we would not have been born in sin, right? I'm, you know, Christy, what year were you born in? 93. Okay. So that means that if Jesus died 2,000 years ago and his death got rid of death and, and sin and the law and everything, then you wouldn't be having any problems because it was... You see what I'm saying? But it's not based on his death alone, but our faith and the, in the reality of that as it affects us now and looking for the effect now. And you're looking for the effect because you're, you're actually looking for the cause that will bring about that effect. And the cause is my present faith in a reality that I am crucified with Christ. All right. <clears throat> Instead, it is our death and the acknowledging of it with Christ that releases the power of the cross in our direction. In other words, I mean, I've, I've stood up here. You know, I've, I've taught for quite a few years. You know, this chalkboard, this chalkboard before me, you, you know, most of you, it's been here since you've been here. Before me, this was the chalkboard J.W. Lumen stood in front of at Shiloh and the ranch and all of that. It went from Berean, Warren Litzman, back in 1961, all the way through to uh, J.W. in 70, let's just say 70, 71, up to 80, Three, eighty-three. Oh, when we got, when we got it. Do you know how many times this board has had this drawn on it? Eight thousand two hundred and fifteen. And that's just me in the Bible school. <clears throat> no. But this whole thing has got to be based on your personal seeing of what, I mean, I saw some, in this, this isn't anything, but I saw something in that chart that spurred me to want to see something in the Word. There was something different, something powerful, something of the Lord that challenged my heart and my being to, to press in to know the Lord. And, and I couldn't just go, well, I've seen that chart, you know, like 2,000 times, so could you teach something different? No, you know, it's like in Jamaica, when Deb and I were missionaries there, uh, me and a brother of mine, uh, spiritual brother, Christian brother, Augie, he played guitar and I played guitar. We stood at the side when the Jamaicans started leading worship choruses during the service, you know, like a praise and worship service. They'd get up there and lead, and they would just go, we're playing, you know, we're playing. So Augie, we'd take turns because it'd go so long. I mean, he'd play, and then his arm get tired, go take it, you know, and I'd play and everything. So one day, you know, I said to, to the worship leader, I said, you know, we sang the same the first song, we sang that for 
half an hour. And then we went to the next song, and we, we could have done 15 songs in there. He said, ain't no need moving on if, you know, people aren't going to respond to that one, you know. And I sort of saw his point. He was like, well, you know, why well, do 15 songs and nobody's into it? I'm waiting for him to get the first one, you know. And, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, it doesn't matter. I mean, we can just keep covering this and keep covering this, or there can be that day where in your heart you say, you know what, that's it, that's right. I just, just don't want to play at this. I want Jesus, and I really do want him. And I don't want to be in a church where I can say I want Jesus, but I don't really, but people think I do. Isn't that right, John? Man, I want Jesus, you know? I do. I want Jesus. And I like being around people that want Jesus. Somebody says, well, Randy, couldn't you get a bigger group than this? Yeah, I could. I could, you know, it, it it wouldn't be that hard to get a bigger group. But I don't want a bunch of people that don't want Jesus. I'm always trying to filter it down smaller to the real ones. Some of you, I can't chase off. I've tried. And you just keep hanging on. What is wrong with you people? Apparently you want Jesus too. <clears throat> Amen. All right. So... Um, Uh, yes, it is his death that we have died, and so faith looks to his death as our own death. And that's the difference. We're not just having a faith that looks to his death. We're looking to his death as our own. Amen. Yes. And we have to discover that, as it were, with the eyes of our understanding. Yes. And what a discovery it is when you see it. What a discovery. I mean, you think about the people in this room and all the different backgrounds and the things people have been into and, th and how their lives have changed and the direction of their life has changed. And, and in so many ways, none of them alike, you know, but very different people. And yet it feels like that all those animals all of a sudden stop in their own life and just heading towards the ark. You know, heading toward that cross and that ark, getting inside of that thing and going through the death together. You know, it's called and all of those animals in different places and all of a sudden, man, I got to go. You know, can you imagine all the other, the, you know, two deer start heading out and the rest of them going, where are you going? I don't know, but man, I know I got to go toward that there thing. You know, <laughs> it's, it, well, you know, why? Are you stupid? You just, you know, it's just in me. It's just in me. And you go, well, you, you do realize you're going with a couple of lions too, don't you? <laughs> They're right there walking with you. Because I don't care what, who, whatever. I just want to be in that ark with the, with the Lord and with Noah and whoever the Lord brings in there. All right, last sentence here. When acknowledged by valid faith, then we see the power of it released. All right, I got a long section here called uh, The Contrast of Government. So, Lindsay, this, this teaching now will be called The Contrast of Government. The point of this new form of kingdom is not just to govern and dictate over its subjects ex externally, but to animate and govern from within, to animate. Something that's like an inanimate object almost becomes animated, but animated by his life, his motives. There's a governmental change because, there's a govern because there is a death to one nature and its motives and the receiving of another nature and let's take it beyond just nature, the nature of Christ, another person. You know, Jesus said in John 5, 39, he said, search the scriptures. Okay, and that's where most people stop, and if they, if they do, they'll just search the scriptures. He says, search the scriptures, 
They are they which testify of me. But you won't, he's, this is his word still, but you won't come to me that you might have life. Because you're not coming to the scriptures for a person and for a life change. You go the, to the scriptures to get comfort or to prove your point or to argue with somebody or to feel like you learned something. Jesus said, search the scriptures. There, there's a person to be discovered in every word, in every sentence, in every verse, in every chapter. There's a person, and he's that big. He's that big. He's that big. The Ancient of Days. Without beginning and without end. You know, and I know that I have barely, I know this, and I'm not, you know, I'm not as factual as I can be. I've barely personally scratched the surface of the Lord in this, in this, in this book, much less. I'm talking about just Galatians. You know. <laughs> and so there is this, uh, there is a, a, a government that is Christ in his motives and nature in us that begins to dictate new, first new views and new vistas of reality, of reality, really, of reality. I'm telling you. And with that, he gives himself, not just in, in a revelation view of himself, thank God for that, but that's not all. Then there is, as it were, an imparting of the things that he's governed by, which is him. He's governed by him, you know. Uh, Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. To be in the kingdom is to be governed by the king from within. The former lords and masters that had dominion in our lives functioned on a completely different basis than the lordship of Christ. The kings of the Gentiles Lord it over the people. But Jesus said, but it shall not be so with you. I don't know if you're familiar with most churches or a lot of churches and how they're governed and everything, but, you know, many of them, they're run by a pastor. And you go, well, yeah, that's right. What's wrong with that? Well, first of all, there's no example, not even one example of that in the New Testament. The church should be governed by elders who are governed by the Lord. Well, I mean, that's just, that's right. We, we have elders and we meet and we determine direction. And within our elders, we have some that are pastors or teachers or whatever, but you know, or or somebody say, well, it's not the pastor; it's the fivefold ministry. You never see that anywhere. That the fivefold ministry, or a pastor, or anybody, that that's the governing body. It's the elders. It's the governing body, and those five, what they call the fivefold ministry. In truth, it's not even that. Did you know that? The, the in Ephesians, when it talks about it, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers, is actually one word. You check it out. So that so you know, and that Elijah, you know, and he says, "Well, there's no look, look out." You know, the Lord says, "Look out and see the if there the rain's coming." They'd had famine and no rain for all that many years, and so he goes and looks. He comes back and says, "No, Lord, nothing yet." And he goes, "Go look again." No, Lord. Suddenly, he comes back the third time. He says, "There's a cloud." For the first time, in all this famine and no rain, there's a cloud shaped like a man's hand. And the preacher says, "That's the fivefold ministry." You know, and it really, you know, it would be a hand that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm sorry I get off on this stuff, you know. You see why I, I do my best to stay on track with emphasizing Christ. But, but there, is this, there is these realities that are true, and they become, they get pushed up so big 
and Jesus is so small, and well, we've got Jesus. Well, you know, do you have him as, as government? Is he the, your kingdom? Well, no, that's why we go to the five-fold ministry, so that they can help us, the anointed men of God. Anyway, God help me. The, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over you. But Jesus said, but it shall not be so with you. And when he said that, he was talking to me. He said, you're not going to be like a Gentile that lords over people. And I tell you what, you know, I believe, I believe the head, Jesus is the head of the body, right? I believe the mind belongs to the body. Do you believe that? Therefore, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. I submit myself to you. And I submit myself to the other elders. And I submit myself to women in the church if the need calls for it, if it is proper and right. And I feel it's the Lord and it's the flow of life. But I don't walk around and go, well, can't listen to a woman. And, woman and, well, you're too young and well, you're too old and you're too pretty and you're too, you know. <laughs> so the only one I can listen to is me. I'm the only one trustworthy. I'm the only one I trust. That's not right. <laughs> you know, so much wrong with all of this. And yet, and yet, the bottom line of what is wrong is we've left Jesus out. If Jesus said, it's not that, it shouldn't be that way. It is that way with the Gentiles, but not with you. He didn't mean with you Jews or you Christians. He meant with you that are governed by me. The kingdom of God is within you. This is, this is how, it, but it will not be so with you like it, is, it has been with them. In God's mind, Jesus is not the exalted potentate on the throne. I mean, think about it. In God's mind, Jesus is not the exalted potentate on the throne, but is the lamb slain that was exalted to the throne. Well, some people, that's shocking. Some, some, you know, and I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but some people go, wow, this new pope, he's really good. That ain't Jesus. I don't care how good he is. He's, we need Jesus, folks. Yeah. Well, it's just such a change. Yeah. Okay, so we went from the bad, the evil fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the good now, you know. Is he born again? Well, I don't know about that, but he's, he's, he's pretty snazzy. You know, he's like a superhero. Well, that's really what we need. You say, well, Randy, you're just, you just put down everything. Everything but Jesus. That's right. He's the one that was raised up, and he's the one we should be exalting. And he's the one God exalted. But God didn't exalt him and say, okay, now you're the exalted potentate. Rule over these dudes. I almost said a bad word there. <laughs> but he said, you are the slain lamb exalted to the throne. And there's nothing more beautiful in the eyes of the Father. <clears throat> the measure and method of God's power is not known by the exercise of strength and force, but by selflessness. The extent of that self-giving is seen in its full manifest, manifest glory at the cross. Woo! At the cross, the Father looked and said, how selfless. The only one who doesn't deserve to die, and he's the only one dying. For example, the institution of using a cross was instituted by the Romans as a means of striking, you know, hanging people on the cross, crucifixion. The Romans instituted that cross and to hang people on that cross. Uh, and they used it as a means of striking fear in the hearts of its subjects. It not only removed all contenders by removing the opposition, meaning they would be afraid to go up against the Romans lest they be crucified, 
but, f but fear of it brought the masses to their knees. I mean, anybody see, what was the name of that movie with the uh, Spartacus, I think. And it just shows field after field after, you know, mile after mile of people that the Romans hung on crosses, you know. It was their way of subduing every nation and all the masses. <clears throat> However, by means of the, the Romans' very instrument of power and fear, the cross, Jesus raises up a new kind of power, transforming their, their symbol into a symbol of love and peace. Oh, my God. Jesus did not simply suffer the pains they inflicted upon him, but at the same time suffered their deserved punishment in their place. That shows us the contrast between kingdoms right there. <laughs> One kingdom's taken, put the cross in the ground, you, hang him up there. Anybody that brings opposition to me, anybody that doesn't like my ideas, anybody that doesn't, hang them on a cross. Jesus comes along, transforms that cross. Everybody wants to wear one, you know. Oh, I'm a Christian. Yeah, are you dead? No, but I've got a nice, but it's pretty. You know, mine's got a diamond in the middle. <clears throat> Moving right along. The kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world both exhibit forms of power. But the Lord demonstrates a completely different form of it. The kind of power to transform life out of death. Now see, we believe that for, you know, one day when I die and go in the grave, I believe... There'll be life out of death, but don't ask me to give up anything now and lay down my life. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, I only believe that for the grave. Don't ask me to live according to it. God's power is love. We might all agree that it is tr a true transformation when one who used to use power to destroy enemies now gives up that power and dies for its enemy. Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, became such a man. There cannot exist a greater transformation of a human being than this. A true transformation when one used to use power to destroy their enemies now gives up that power and dies for his enemy. Hmm. Well, I just ripped right through that subtitle. I'm, I'm <laughs> pretty proud of myself, actually. Yes. Yeah, you know, we look at things. Um, I mean, I was in a country once, and I was doing a conference. 
And, uh, you know, a lot of the countries uh, look down on the U.S. and, you know, for good reason for certain things. A person said to me, well, you Americans just glorify violence. And that may not seem like a, a valid statement to some of us, but when every movie that they get from the United States is the degree that it is, and then every war that's ever started nowadays, we're, we're doing it. And, you know, I mean, I'm just, you know, and then they hear about young teenagers walking into movie theaters or schools and killing little children. And you, you, you know what I mean? I mean, and they're going, well, we don't have that going on in our. To them, that's a very real thing. I mean, it's like you, you, it's just everywhere, and you just, it's like you bathe in the blood of it. And this particular man was part of a church group that was fighting with one another and split and anger. And, and I just said, you know, whether it's a nation that's fighting and trying to get its way and trying to, you know, push its ideas or it's somebody standing in a church and arguing with another brother and causing the church split. I said, it's the same spirit. It just hasn't grown to that. And I said, if we, there's no way that we can condemn one thing and not condemn the other. If it's the same thing, it's just not as fully formed. Do you understand what I'm saying? And uh, I said that <clears throat> not to justify the U.S., God, know, God knoweth. I said it because this thing comes right down to the little things in us that, that are big and would be big if given more sway. Um, and for us to point at some area or some people group or something where we can see it more, you know, it's more blatant, and then to judge it without judging those things happening in us, that's wrong. I mean, it's wrong for us, it's wrong for them, it's wrong for them, it's wrong for us. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> but we're not true. We're not true until, until we can first be concerned that we be governed by Christ. Not, you know, I know, I know every Christian wants to go out and change the world. And, and, you know, how many Christians has there been since Jesus died and how changed is the world? I mean, you know, I, one of the things I often think of, I've been around in my years, I've been around incredible youth groups. Man, I mean, a lot of kids and, yeah, and the music and the stuff and, boy, you could just whip them into a lather. And, yeah, you know what I mean? And, and uh and then you watch those kids out of high school, and they go into college and everything, and you never hear another thing. You don't hear it ru rumblings through the earth. You know what I mean? You don't even hear a little wave. It's like they get swallowed up, and they just conform to the regular old world, and everything just keeps on going like it's been going. <clears throat> But for me, I realized I can't change you. And, I, you know, as a pastor, you think, okay, well, my job, <laughs> no. My job is to change what I can, and the only person I can really change is right here. And the only way change will ever really come right here is when I start being real with myself. And the only way I'm going to learn to do that is I'm going to stop identifying big problems that are blatant and say is that same thing in me to any degree and if it is it's the same thing just not as developed and and I need to judge that here because I can't fix that I can you know we, we can judge that by saying that's wrong but we can't 
judge it in the sense of we, what we can judge in us. I judge this to be wrong, and I'm going to do something about it. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, you can take up arms against that, then aren't you doing the same thing? It's the same, you know, that violent spirit. Well, oh, you Americans are all bloodthirsty. Well, what's your attitude right now? Well, bloodthirsty, but I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, I mean, don't, I, I don't know, you know? And so, and, and I, t I didn't tell you that story to judge that person. That's fine. I'm telling you that story to say I can't even change that guy or anything else, but I can look for telltale signs of anything that's not Christ. You know what? I don't always know what's Christ in me. Did you know that? I don't know always, but I know what's not Christ. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, well, I don't know. You know, I mean, people walk around in a fog like, well, I don't know what's Jesus in me. I don't, I don't know. Well, do you know what's not Jesus? Oh, yeah. Well, then start there. <laughs> you know. And, and, and start seeking the, the Holy Spirit that you might decrease and he might increase. Now, that's only going to happen by Christ. I saw some, and actually, I didn't see it. It was, it was going in the background where I was located. And it was uh, Ray Romano, and, you know, everybody loves Raymond and his wife. And I've never watched too much of the show, but I... But in this particular one in the background, they had, you know, I guess they don't get along well and they, they abuse one another in language and whatever in this sitcom. And so they decided, you know, the thing to do is they need to be nicer to one another. That, you know, well, you know, you know how good that works. When you try to be nicer and it's not Christ, things get worse and you start being meaner after a while. You know, um, when you dedicate your flesh, you know, and God's, you know, God's heard it a billion times, you know, more than that, you know. Oh, Lord, <laughs> tears. I'm sorry, and I dedicate my flesh, and my flesh is going to serve you. And, and here's my favorite line, and I'll never do it again. You know where I got sick of all of that? Me, when, when I was growing up. And really, I mean, I was first to the altar, and it was always, I'll never do it again. And then as soon as I get out the door, I mean, I've experienced it. As soon as I got out the door of the church, after just the greatest, you know, this was, the spirit fell, and I felt God. And there was just, it was just so much, and I knew I was changed, changed, changed until I hit the back door. And then, boom, right back to this thing. I said, I'll never do it again. Right back to the same thing. I just went, what the heck is wrong with me? I mean, that, was, that, that one marked something in me and said, you know what? All of that whining and acting like you're so spiritual and everything doesn't do anything. You've got to find something real. What is it? Um... Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And I had to quit find it, finding the, uh, the ways that the church said, this will set you free, and find out what would liberate me from me by him. He is the liberation. He's not just a liberator. That's the wonderful thing about Jesus being Lord. He's not just Lord. He's the Lord of life. He's the life. And he's the Lord of our life because he is the life and the way and the truth. Those, you know, the, God means for us to have, you know, what do you call it? Milestone moments, places in your walk that, that shake you and, and point you in a different direction. And, and after all those wonderful altar calls that I had gone to and dedicated my flesh over and over, I had to be confronted with something that honestly was just so ugly that I just went, oh my God, this, 
you know, you either, you either come to the, the conclusion that this Christian stuff doesn't work or whatever does work, I don't have a clue what it is. <laughs> and I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And it did. It, it turned some things. I quit depending on my feelings, you know. The, the preacher would be talking and maybe having an altar call or something or maybe just sharing. And, you know, I'd watch people and they would go, <sighs> you know, somebody would be sitting there quietly. And go, <sighs> you know, and somebody else would be, you know, be like, oh, you know, and I'm just sitting there. You know, I don't feel nothing, you know. I'm just going, what the heck's wrong with me? I don't feel nothing. All these people getting Jesus. There must be something special about them, and I don't feel anything. And the Lord says, it's not about your feelings. Are you with me? Is your heart with me? Can you say yes? Yeah. And I quit, you know, and this is me. I'm just, you know, your experience isn't supposed to be my experience, okay? But I, I, went, I quit going down to the altar and going like this. You know, because you know, because I thought in my mind, I thought if I did this, God would go look, His hand shaking. We ought to do something. <laughs> well, I mean, really, I mean, it almost came down to that. It's like, well, He's not going to do nothing unless you're really, you know, doing like that. And I so I started experimenting. <laughs> I did. I'm sorry. I just went down the altar and said, "Okay, hit me. What do you got?" And he said, do you believe that you're dead with, with my son? I do. He said, do you believe that Christ is your life? I do. He said, get up and walk in newness of life. Rise up and walk in newness of life. Take up your bed. Get up. Quit shaking and start walking. <laughs> now, you know, and I'm not, you know. Got, you know, these last two classes have gotten me in more trouble because it sounds like I'm anti all this stuff, and I'm not, you know. Because you're either pro-Christ or anti anything that's not Christ, so you're anti-Christ. No, no, that's not right. Just kidding. But, but I just want to say to you that there is a a place of heart, a condition of heart that may not shake or rattle or roll or whatever. Sometimes it might, but that your body might. That's fine. That's, you understand what I'm saying? That's fine if your body does. Um, New Creation Fellowship is called an interdenominational church instead of non-denominational. When we well, you have to sign up with the government and become a corporate name. You know, you have to do that. You're required to do that to function. So we had to choose, are we going to be interdenominational or non-denominational? I said, I don't want to be noted as for something that's non. <laughs> you know what I mean? What are you? We're non. We're just against everything. <laughs> you know? I said, I want to be interdenominational. I want... Anybody from any background to be in here and be able to raise their hands if they want to. I was raised United Methodist. You sit there like a stump. You know, I mean, you just, you know, you, what's going on here? I mean, and that's in the Methodist church. That's not with any shake. The hands going up. It was like, did you hear how they put the money in the offering place? It clanked. Oh, my God. They're so unspiritual. <clears throat> and, and I wanted it to be where the outward was up to you. Whatever that is. You know, and some people go, well, you know, I don't like, I don't like that member at New Creation that shouts out loud. Ah, hallelujah or something. You know. 
if they're worshiping the Lord, leave them alone. But know that no amount of shaking or shouting gets you anything with the Lord. You're one with the Lord by Christ crucified or you're not at all. And if your response to that has you dancing on tables, I'm right there with you, okay? I mean, I am. I really don't have a problem with any manifestation, you know? I mean, remember the Toronto thing? People barking like dogs. As long as they don't poop on the floor, I'm okay. I'm okay with it, okay? <laughs> well, that's a good place to end right there. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do that and your heart is with the Lord then God receives your heart do you understand what I'm saying I'm telling you that God man looks on the outward appearance but God looks on the heart and I'm telling you that many of the things that will turn people off might be the Lord and many of the things that, that you find acceptable, uh, God may not find acceptable. And many of the things you find unacceptable. He, so interdenominational means you worship the Lord you want to, and we have other people that will worship the Lord that they want to, and we're all, but we're all one. We're all on one vine. We're all drawn of the same life, and we all have the same heart, and that is... We want the vine life inside of us. And if, it's, if, it's a, if he is a vine, if he is a tree that pops out 12 kind of different fruit a year, now on one branch over here, there's some grapefruit coming out, and over here some tangerines, it's still the same life. But your, it's your heart. Keep your heart after the Lord and don't, worry quit worrying about other people let's pray father we just ask you to uh, continue to speak to our hearts not just along the lines of the teaching but as your spirit is pressing in on us your spirit is pressing he's pressing in on us that christ uh, and his spirit may be more essential in us than the externals. And Father, we just ask you that by the movement of your spirit, you'll break down the walls and the barriers that divide us. You'll open our eyes to the one that we're one with and that we're all one with. And we'll love him and we'll love one another because they are him. They are one with him. They are his body, even as we are his body. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed. And please.